Yeah, I don't like jumping into a game where everyone else already has experience and expects you to know how to play. Also, I don't really like hidden role games where there's voting involved, so like Secret Hitler or any of those other weird ones. Not Battlestar Galactica. Battlestar Galactica is different because you can actually have like you can actually make a difference in the game without revealing yourself or even with revealing yourself you can do something but in all those other secret ones as soon as you're revealed to be the bad guy you're just out Mm. as opposed to like Battlestar Galactica if you're revealed to be the bad guy you can just blow up the ship and then still kill the people like that's a a valid way to win yeah if you have a day free and seven or eight hours to play a game Battlestar Galactica is for you it's actually really fun but yeah we always just kill one of our friends right hard. off the bat, just throw him out the space, the, the dock. <laughs> and he's like, what did I do? He's like, it's you. It's, it's, it's probably just, you. It's Engine probably food. you. He like really manipulated one game one time and like was, it did really good at the whole like playing the politics thing. And like, we just didn't suspect him. So now every time we just, just for good measure, we just throw him out the airlock. <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, I will you never, I, I will never live that down. Well, like, nope. Your first character always goes out the airlock, even if you're human. <laughs> <laughs> Let me guess. Out the airlock? Yep. All right. Yeah. Don't All even right. worry about it. I'll, he just I'll walks see himself myself. over there. Yeah, at this see point. myself out. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Dog Ear Discourse, a nerdy little double date where we talk about the book we're reading and where we left off. Every month, we're pulling a new and exciting book from our shelf. We've broken them down so you can buddy read with us or just hang out while we discuss, predict, and nerd out. If you want to read along, right now we're reading Girl, Serpent, Thorn by Melissa Basher-Dust. We just started this book, and here are the main characters of the first half. Soraya, the main character. Sorush, Soraya's twin brother. Shaw, he is the king. Tamane, Soraya's mom, ruling in her son's stead until he was old enough to rule. Azad, the mysterious stranger, saves Sorush from a div attack. Pavane, the div slash demon in the castle dungeon that tried to attack Sorush. Ramin, Layla's brother, who is a childhood friend of Soraya. And Lele, childhood friend and betrothed to Sorush. Shamar, evil Shaw who betrayed his kin and became a div. Simorg. The legendary bird who served as a symbol and protector of Atashar. So a lot of these names are a little unfamiliar to us. This book is basically like a Persian retelling. So a lot of the names are just ones we're not terribly familiar with. So if we butcher any of them in this retelling, sorry. Uh, This is a bigger slaughter than the one we will encounter later in the book. (laughs) Chris, can you give us the 60-second recap of the first half of the book? Sure. I'm ready when you are. Danny, you ready with the timer? I am. All right, Chris. Count me in. Three, two, one, go. Okay, so if you've ever watched Frozen, you have now uh, read the first half of this book. We got a uh, person who is cursed. She can't really touch much. Uh, Her name is Soraya. She is locked away because she's cursed by her family, so therefore no one should love her. Um, she talks about how she has a nice little garden that she loves. It's a garden of, uh, flowers. And, um, then she sees a dude and falls in love at first sight. He, uh, she sneaks out and 30 seconds. she finds out his name is Azad as they, um, as he says he loves her and she loves him. And now they're all lovey dovey, um, but she can't touch him. So she's trying to find a way to break her curse. So she goes to see a uh, div in the basement and the div is like a demon i guess and she tells her hey i can tell you what the cure is and she's like oh no and so she goes to see a priest in a place of the dead and uh the priest tells her to go steal the magic f- feather which protects Three, the kingdom she does um two, all heck break loose and then uh, the demons win <laughs> end scene very Shut. good, Chris. Thank you. <laughs> good job. Yeah, so I was really excited when the demons won on that one. Yeah, that but was so cool. we should get to that eventually. <laughs> Chris, want to tell us about this lovely drink you've prepared for us? So this week's drink is uh, Soraya's Golston, which a Golston is her little um, 
Rose Garden. It's a, a land of roses is how it translates. And Soraya is the main character. She can only touch plants. Otherwise, she kills everything. So we went with the kind of a rose-themed drink. Um, I think it's one of the best-looking drinks that we've made so far. I took about a... A uh, quarter of a pear, chopped it up. I, I chose pear because uh, it's kind of like a hotter area of fruit. Um, and this book really takes place a lot in the, um, th- it's in the desert. I was thinking more like Aladdin. Like yeah. if, I was, yeah. if, I was to, if I was to picture a place, it would be like Aladdin with Jasmine's castle and yeah, stuff like too. that. So um, what I, I did was I took a pear, um, chopped it up and put it in the ice, put a, uh, about a bar spoon of Lemon over top of that, make it a little bit fresh, draw out some of the flavor of the pear. Then I took a half ounce of elderberry liqueur and one ounce of vodka. For that, I just used St. Germain and Tito's, just basic stuff. Um, And then I took one ounce of pomegranate juice. Pomegranate juice has this really tart but sweet flavor to it. Um, And pomegranates are like a delicacy over in the Middle Eastern areas. So, uh, and then I took half of a bar spoon of rose water. It's really uh, powerful stuff, so you don't need a lot of it. Um, Shook that over ice, and then I uh, poured it into a chilled glass that's rimmed with sugar and dried rose petals. I made sure to get the edible kind, so basically no additives, no perfumes, no nothing. You don't want to get the, the, you don't want to actually rim your glass with uh, potpourri, potpourri, because then (laughs) you just, I mean... You'll have one good drink and then you'll die. Um, <laughs> and then I just topped it with soda water just to, to balance it out. I found that if you didn't bring some soda water to the table, it was too pungent of a flavor. It just kind of balances it out and softens it up. And this is called Soraya's Goldstone. Well, you did a really nice job. This really does feel like the perfect warm weather drink. And it brings together all of those like really subtle flavors. There's a lot in this drink and you can taste every part of it, which is a feat in itself. So great job. I feel like royalty just drinking. Yeah. Yeah, so we <laughs> we tried this out without the rose water and without the little rose petals on the, the edge of it, because those came in later. Mm. And it didn't quite have the same flavor to it. It, huh. it. it the rose actually does kick in and make it a little bit more flowery. So yeah, yeah, it actually good. tasted like almost nothing when the rose was not in there. And then when you added it, then all of a sudden you could taste all of the flavors. Like oh, you couldn't t- really taste, it tasted like sweet. But then once the rose water was added, then you could taste the pear and the pomegranate and everything else. So it's like, I don't know what kind of witchcraft is going on in here, <laughs> but whatever he did, he made it work. And so. it was really fitting to have our story take place in a kingdom when we we're drinking something that like we kind of take for granted every day now, but back in the day, it was like you had a, to have like a, a rose garden where you can actually get roses from or like all of these things that we kind of just take for granted now, mm-hmm. but were, you know, basically only for the royalty. All right, cheers, everyone. Cheers. 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 So what did you guys think of this first half? I really liked it. It was a little more complex than I was expecting because I knew this was a YA. I liked it. Um, There was a lot of new vocabulary for me that I did not know before and I had to look up. Um, Usually when you encounter a book that's introducing a lot of new vocab, uh, they tell you what it means. And this book took for granted that you know what it means like every time, Mm -hmm. which I was like, okay, a lot of the words I started skipping over but then I went back and I actually looked them up and they all do have meaning. So mm. one of the things I thought about was I'm fam- more familiar with, you know, the English royalty system where you have dukes, duchesses, counts, etc. It made me realize how those words would be unfamiliar to someone who knows what a spa bed is, knows what a, um, shaw. You know, a shaw is, things like that, where... It's like, you don't know that the spa bed is the chief of the army, like Mm. the head of the army, and it's usually a a handed down position to the kid, things like that. I kind of liked that it was presented as, yeah, you know this already, because it made me feel more casual with it as well, Mm -hmm. which... And I I, I guessed, like I had to guess like what things were... Oh, I just looked it up. I just had oh, my phone okay. and Googled it as I went. I, I, I mean, I, like I, I do the yeah. same too. Yeah, I'll try to Google it. So oh, that, I, I was just figured that I would eventually figure it out <laughs> via context. <laughs> so like, mm. did the introduction of all these new terms break the immersion for you? Or did it like you just kind of went with it and kept going? I was really interested immediately when we started to read the book. 
and drawn in because I was like, wow, I am not familiar with this vocab and I am not familiar with this world. I was very, very interested at first. I'll start by saying that I absolutely hate monarchies. Anytime there is one, I'm just rooting for their downfall. I don't care if they're doing good or, or evil. I'm like, I cannot wait till your castle crumbles. <laughs> what? Yeah. But this I'm, is something I'm on I didn't your side. know about you guys. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm oh. totally on your side. Anti-authoritarianism to the max. Yeah, I'm watching Game of Thrones and I'm like, when does George Washington show up? <laughs> You're like, Put did I rebellion. hear the word king? Spits on the floor. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm out of here. <laughs> but interestingly enough, I didn't have that reaction to hearing about their because you like, didn't know it was a king yeah exactly i'm like oh yes shaw yes i worked with a man his last name was shaw i was like yes <laughs> right. that's, that's and then i'm like wait a minute was he a prince of some yeah, sort of a king they tricked you into believing in him yeah that's true but yeah that was my reaction after the fact i was like wait a minute i'm reading a story about kings but no it was it was interesting like you said chris that like having to go back and actually look up the terms for some of these things. Because I'll do that anyway, especially with some of the stories where you don't necessarily know maybe some of the lore behind it. Mm -hmm. So it didn't break me out of the immersion there. Yeah, there's so also some uh, customs that Juan was talking about. Oh, that's common. And I've never heard of it before. What did you say earlier? The like sky funerals? Oh, yeah, or... the drachma is like old Roman Persian area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it did exactly what they were talking about in the book where, spoiler alert for later, not that we haven't already given you all the spoilers, but anyway, um, <laughs> where where basically you have this sky funeral, I guess it is, because they don't want the bodies to touch the ground. So they put them on like little pedestals in this one area where the birds can go eat it. And then that's like the evil desecrated area because human bodies are unclean. I learned about this because I had to look up the word. I was like, what the heck's a drachma? Because they were just throwing it around so casually in the book that I was like, okay, time to go do some research. No, this is a modern day culture that they still practice this because they live so high up in the mountains that there isn't the bacteria. The bacteria that is required to break down bodies doesn't, it can't live up there. Oh. So they have one guy that basically he's like the mortician. Yeah. They have like the town or the village mortician that will, when somebody dies, he, you know, after like the funeral, they will grab the, they'll take the body up to like a uh, bluff and he has to basically break the body down and then allow the vultures to come and consume it. And that's, that's how they perform their like modern day funerals. Hmm. That's so cool. I kind of wish that I was more like you guys and looked up the words because then I would have known that. And that is really interesting info. I just kind of read it and let it come to me or not. And kind of just breeze past it. Same. I wasn't also, this is a fantasy book too. So my uneducated self was just kind of maybe like thinking that maybe it was made up what, in like a fantasy magical. That's completely valid. But yeah. I, whenever I encounter that in a fantasy world, they tell you what it is mm -hmm. and they weren't telling me. Yeah. And that's I was like, saying. and that's what, like, I think I ground to a halt around page six and I was like, <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> and so I started, I went through and started looking stuff up and I even wrote down that, you know, I wasn't uh, I wasn't fond of that idea of like that level of immersion breaking mm -hmm. of it ripped me out of the book and I had to put it down and look up a couple of terms. And I'm like, I'm not sure I'd like that. But then that also got me reflecting on my own uh, biases towards, mm. um, I don't know, Anglo-Saxon cultures. And it's like, oh, huh. <laughs> yeah, I need to read more. So question for you guys who looked things up. Is a div the Persian word for a demon, or is this something that she made up for the book? So I know Yatu, which is um, what the the human sorcerers that are referenced in chapter two, the beginning mm -hmm. of chapter two, um, I know that they are a kind of boogeyman, and the plant that they used is actually a ward against evil. The one that they oh, burn so in the in real Yeah, yeah. They burn lore. the root seeds to ward off against evil spirits and the evil eye. Interesting. So a div or a dev are monstrous creatures within Middle Eastern lore. So yes. Oh, okay. So they yeah. are real folklore. Cool. I think the author really incorporated a lot of stuff from actual Middle Eastern culture and brought it, put it in. Yeah, and it said 
something about how basically it was derived from Persian mythology and integrated into Islam. And then through Islam, it helped spread throughout those countries mm. because people carried those that lore with them as they also spread the religion. So this book starts off with this girl who is trapped kind of in a castle. She's daughter of the king. So I guess I'd make her a princess. She kills everything at the first touch, just dead. And so I immediately went to like frozen vibes here and there's a lot of lore and stuff. And that's why we were referencing divs and stuff like that is because the divs are apparently the ones that cursed her. I thought it was kind of interesting that she's only used her power, accidentally killed a butterfly and that's it. And a beetle. Oh, and a beetle. She did run her finger over a beetle's oh, back okay. and it just it, it did. I felt that one. I've I'm I'm battling some beetles out in the garden right now. And I read that part and I was like <laughs> I wish I could do that. Only. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I she's so careful even now, even though she's never accidentally killed somebody, where it's like after so many years of having this curse where you would kill somebody, I feel like it would almost be like you kind of have to see it to believe it, kind of. Yeah. How old do you think she is? Maybe 16. They didn't never really reference it, did they? I feel like they did reference at one point. I think she's 16. Okay. Because I think I read a part where it said something about like, oh, when her, maybe her friend or something turned 15, there was like a reference to an age, but that's what I, I don't know why I got the okay. idea that she was like 15, 16. Yeah. She, she drives us that in the book. So yeah. I was just... Well, if she's I, driving, she must be 16. I was, yeah. Perfect, yeah. Um, I was 19. <laughs> but uh, I was just curious if anybody had uh, figured that one out because I was like, I don't know how old she is, but she seems real gullible. So yeah, that's another thing in this book. You are definitely not spoon-fed information. You have to figure out a lot of stuff on your own, which I like. I like yeah. it too. I feel like time gets wasted when I'm being told things that I would be able to figure out from context. Which is probably part of why I kind of agree with you in general, Danny, about how you don't like the info dumps unnecessarily over-talking and over-sharing all this stuff. It's like, I'll figure it out. You don't have mm -hmm. to tell me that. It makes me more interested and like more attentive to the mm -hmm. book, I think. Because like, oh, I have to actually do work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. Remembering things. Okay. They're not going to remind me of this. Okay. Mm -hmm. I kind of like that she is presented as a character that is hidden away, right? At this point in time that we know her, or that we meet her, I guess, is that she's been hidden away for a while. The only person who comes and visits her is her mom, who, you know, brings her roses every time she comes to visit, which is growing this beautiful garden, which means she comes to visit all the time. And it was what inspired this drink that we made. <laughs> but she has not always been hidden away, and she's not always been by herself. Like, she grew up with kids that she played with. She didn't ever touch them, but she wasn't, like, a complete recluse for her entire life. You know, and, like Layla and, Layli, Le, 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 and Ramen. Uh-huh. Or whatever their names are. <laughs> Ramin, maybe. Ramin and Layli, or <laughs> Layla and Ramen. Whatever you decide to call them, that's probably <laughs> their names. Yeah, and her twin, Sarush. So the, Sarush. those four all kind of hung out together as kids. And then as Sarush starts to grow into his responsibilities of being the new Shah, aka King, my takeaway was that was when everybody kind of abandoned her, yeah, more or less, and left her to just kind of watch all the goings on from her secret tower. Like you're an adult now, right? You're like four. You can, you can take care of yourself. Yeah. Right? You'll be fine. You'll be fine. And it was interesting because there was a there was a passage in there, and I believe it was so rushed that accidentally let it slip that the reason that she was being kind of tucked away was that all these nobles were starting to get a little pissed off at him and his family and the way that they were ruling. Yeah, and it was like because this family is supposed to be ordained by the creator to rule, like they were given the protection from this uh, magical big bird. Um, because they were given the magical feather, they were the ones that are ordained to rule. And all of the other nobles are like looking for an opportunity to just be like, out you go. So it's our time to rule. Yeah. And so they're like, they could use anything against us, including you, demon girl, who were born that way, apparently. So, yeah. Now, if I remember correctly, Destroyer was capitalized, right? It could, Destroyer and Creator. creator. The, yep. The twins and... 
There was a lot of duality in this book. Yeah, no, that was that was definitely something I noticed too. The idea of like th- that. Well, for one, it was interesting that they just called him Destroyer. It's like that's fitting, but it was very like Alpha Omega kind of like there is there were always extremes on one end. It was mm-hmm. either something that created and like brought you to light, or this other being the thing that was just like. And, and I think she was told multiple times, like, you are of the Destroyer because of the curse, like, the mm-hmm. one time that somebody found out about it. Like, it's like the high priest was like, you're yeah. the devil. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's, she's like, is there any guidance? Is there anything? He's like, nope, you belong to the Destroyer. Yep. That's, uh, that's your... Uh, turns that's out that guy was kind of... Uh, kind of a dick. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I also, like, you, you said um, that, you know, the Destroyer and your... You, you know, you go in the darkness or you come in the light. I thought the fire reference was pretty cool here because they have this bonfire with the magic. Um, and they described this in the beginning of the book that there's this whole ritual with the with the bonfire and there's protection going on. And usually fire is the destroyer. Most people mm. see fire as a destructive thing, not necessarily a protective thing. But this kind of goes into that you know, cultural ideology of if you're in the camp, you're next to the fire, you're fine. If you're outside the camp, you're in the darkness and you're bad. So it's us versus them. I found that interesting. So if there are beings of the destroyer, and I think there's like three or four different beasties. Well, there's, there's a couple of different factions that they reference of these divs. You find out later Mm -hmm. that running theme behind, I think a lot of that, like you start to you start to find out that these things are a little bit more nuanced than they seem at the surface like oh yeah all the divs are the same you guys are just a bunch of weird creatures and then it's like oh no no there's there are some that look almost almost look human like our friend that's locked in the dungeon mm-hmm. uh what is her name parvena parvena yeah yeah so she almost looks human but there are other monstrosities out there and to the people they're like, oh, they are all the same. But I think also to this character, she starts to think that like at first it's she's like, oh, cool. If I go get the feather, then I'll be fixed. Then it's like, well, not quite. There's a couple more steps. And it, it just it's it lends itself to how she approaches stuff. She approaches situations almost thinking that they're going to be very simple to solve. Oh, yeah. And then it turns into a whole other thing because they're. It's like, oh, uh, maybe I should have asked a couple more questions before I just <laughs> dove right in. But not not like out of ignorance or stupidity. It's just like being naive and young that you're like, oh, I could definitely. And, it's like and a running like, theme in this book. Yeah, exactly. So, Druges, mm-hmm. Casters, and Pariks. All with different skills and talents. Mm-hmm. So, I was like They thinking... only describe the Pariks, though. Mm-hmm. So we don't know whether the druges are the bestial ones or, and we don't even know what a... The K-stars or... The K-caster. But it was, yeah, later they give some descriptions of different, like, devs and the way that they look, but they never just, they never mentioned, like, oh, these are that class and that's this race of them. It's just a bunch of them. There's, like, a horde of them. Well, and I don't know that it is necessarily super important for us to know every detail of their different races at least at this point because it feels to me like they're trying to give information as Soraya is learning it so so her world is it's us versus the divs and then she finds this div has been captured and is in the dungeons and so she's thinking to herself oh they might have answers as to why I'm why I am the way I am like if I touch anybody that they might die so she sneaks around in the secret passages that she knows all about, sneaks past the guards and goes and talks to this dev. And that's when she learns that there are more of them. They're not all just one conglomerate of species. There's actually different types. And she knows that because the div told her that. So do we know that because like, maybe that's why we just haven't been fed all of that information is because she doesn't know all that information. Oh, yeah. So, like, her brother might, because he's the king, he might know, well, king in training, I guess, mm-hmm. he might know that there are multiple factions, but he never told her, and so she's ignorant of that fact, so we're learning it as she goes. That's what I'm thinking. Okay. I, I dig it. So, I love the fact that there's the love and first sight trope that happens. <laughs> like, 
she sees a dude coming home with brother dearest who she doesn't recognize. She makes eye contact and she's like, ooh, I like that guy. <laughs> and it is great. Um, that's a very common trope in uh, in medieval lore. Actually, there's a lot of uh, Chaucer and, you know, uh, Holy Grail and stuff like that where you get um, some of that love at first sight stuff. So I love seeing it here, especially since it's almost always mocked as silly. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. It's understandable in her situation because she's so lonely. She's a 16-year-old she's... girl who's very lonely. <laughs> and she saw a nice she's... sinewy young man. Oh, my God. It, yeah, 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 described she... him as sinewy. Yeah. yeah. So that whole scene, their eyes meet. And he can see her even though she's like hidden away on like a rooftop or something. And she's like daring him to look away, like (laughs) commanding him to look away with her eyes. (laughs) And then she's like, then a challenge. Come find me. I was like, "What?" this is like this. It was page seven. So it was like like right in the beginning of the book. And I was like, like, what are you doing? What? I'm so confused. Those are very mixed signals there. (laughs) Oh, yeah. And that I think plays into a lot of her. Um her attitude towards herself she wants to be loved but she also thinks of herself as a monster Mm -hmm. and so she wants to push people away she knows she's poisonous so she can't get close to somebody but she also wants the affection she talks about the roses like she likes something soft that can be loved even though it's dangerous so that's kind of a parallel there like she wants this guy to come in like you know this is gonna be fun but she can't (laughs) because then she'd kill him so come find me. Maybe we can figure out something. She should have had a garden of carnivorous plants. Chomp, chomp, chomp. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So he ac- ends up finding her. And I swear, every time I read a scene, I felt like he had a death wish. Like he was like going above and beyond, like touching her and not oh ever like being careful or anything like that. And I'm like, this is, this is a little sus. It was so funny. He was like Pepe Le Pew following that cat where he's like literally floating (laughs) off the ground with big old heart eyes. Just like, oh, I'll follow you anywhere. What do you need? (laughs) I was, I was not a fan. I was not a fan of this romance. (laughs) Oh, right off the gate. I was, uh, the first thing I thought is that guy's the villain. Yeah. Like the first thing, as soon as, as soon as she like described him and then he shows up and he's just like a. I loved you since the moment I heard about you. Yeah. Locked away in you this castle. You are my favorite story. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> shut up. Um, you are feeding her every single line she wants to hear. Mm-hmm. There yeah. is something wrong with this. I was just getting evil person vibes from him the whole time. Oh, that's I your did favorite not color get too? evil what? person vibes from him. I thought he was just as naive as she was. Oh, no. I thought he was... I Because I was kept drawing all the parallels with Frozen... Oh. I, I immediately thought of how, you know, the redhead, not the fr- freezing girl, but the other one gets to go out of the palace. I don't even know. Anna? That. Yeah, I sure. actually have never seen Frozen, so, so you're going to spoil it for me. Sure. Yep. Uh, good it's luck. only been out for 20 years. You'll be <laughs> okay. <laughs> Spoiler alert <laughs> Please, on things on. that have happened in the past. Um, so so she gets to go out of the palace and she gets she goes out of the palace and on day one, she meets a dude, falls in love, wants to get married. Like, day one i'm like all right well this is and then he turns out to be the villain so Mm. uh yeah that was i did not expect him to be the villain that he was though oh no i wasn't expecting that capital v villain i thought he was gonna be like uh, a spy a spy monster Mm. a spy monster (laughs) yeah the pariks except for they are all described as female so see i i didn't get the evil vibes right off the bat i just thought this guy was a weenie like this wiener (laughs) Until, but, he, until he straight up punches ramen in the face. Oh, even even then, I was like, oh, he's just he's a young he's a young man that is about to get knocked out by a much bigger young man. And then ramen did nothing. But then when he encountered the guards and he just killed oh. them, and he's like, I took care of the problem. Yeah, it's like uh, you could have used your words first, perhaps. Oh, like, I, I loved her reaction to that, which was, it wasn't that that, that he killed them that bothered her it's how well he did it yeah see to me i as soon as that happened i was like oh wow he didn't even try to like make a little bird noise or something to be like oh i'll draw their attention <laughs> nope he's just like i will murder and them stab stab yeah yeah but that only gave you like what seven or eight lines before he actually reveals himself to be the bad guy so yeah. so you were as as 
enthralled as she was. Oh, no, no, no. I, I thought she should have ditched him. I, I didn't think he was good news. I just didn't think he was going to turn out to be as bad. See, this is why if you meet some slimy character in real life, go away. Because he's going to turn into a murderer first and then into a monster. But she had no friends. So any attention was good attention. <laughs> good very good point. She <laughs> Maybe she just thought this is how courtship worked. He's like, yeah, you just randomly murder a couple guys and come back bloody and be like, I did that for you. So now you have to marry me because people lost their lives. You know what friendship I actually did really like was her friendship <laughs> with the demon where they were like, oh, yeah. Where, so she Pravana? would sneak in oh, yeah. and talk to her, talk to this demon. And the demon was like, your mom's been lying to you your, your whole life. You want to know why you have those powers? Because she brought you to the demons and we gave you those powers. Yeah, and she's like, she, she wouldn't do that. And she's like, why? Your, none of your mom's story makes any sense. Ask her. Yeah. And so she, she's like, ah, meh, and like stomps away and asks her mom. And her mom's like, without saying the words, you could just see on her face. She's like, oh. And then she runs back to the demon. She's like, tell me more. What is my whole life? <laughs> what is my whole life? The yeah, I, I liked the the div that was captured. I think she, yeah, was a, she was a really cool one. I love the way that they described her too. Because they were like, they were describing the weird swirls on her skin. And then you find out that she has wings. And she's actually like a moth. Like a moth human. Right? And so that makes me think that the Pariks. I think that's what they're called. The Pariks are um they're all a flighted animal oh right okay. because the one that um that helped her mom right or that her mom helped one of those two things was a, a half owl mm -hmm. the one with owl wings and she's mm -hmm. got moth wings and moth uh skin which oh, i yeah. thought that description was really cool i really like that too i was like oh i want to cosplay this that would be, be so really cool. cool so i didn't even catch on that the moth coloration was her skin because our dog is brindle and so the first time we heard about like her skin was brown with black swirls and i was like oh like new nose oh and i could they mentioned the moth wings and that did not factor in at all i was like oh cool okay she's got wings too but she looks like my dog <laughs> yeah i have to say i didn't i don't, I don't think i thought too much about it either i don't even the moth wings i was just like whatever but all i could see was like the um, it's like the the tribes that like purposely scar their skin in like patterns mm -hmm. that's what i thought i was like oh okay cool she's just got like textured skin i'd never even yeah yeah it was like if you google brown moth that's kind of the skin that yeah. i was going for was, now that you say oh, it it makes cool. complete sense yeah because it's got the brown and the swirls with a little bit of color in there and it, it could be almost regular skin tone of especially of a darker skinned person that just has weird light swirls in it yeah and so that's why she could pass as human i mm. wonder if other ones have feathers oh that would be cool feather people yeah well if they have owl wings well yeah or they could well, be fuzzy the, you know you like could ha you could have foul, uh like the the owl wings without having like feathers on the rest of your body oh i see i was thinking like like lots of feathers that'd yeah. be fun <laughs> so the the demon gives her information that she she just starts to trust this demon more and more as the story turns out to be true that her mom has been fudging the truth about why she is as poisonous as she is. So she decides that she, what she wants to do is lose this ability or curse that will poison people. And she thinks she knows how to do it because the the div told her to go and steal the feather that we were talking about earlier. She's like, well, there's only a couple people that know where the protection feather is. One, my brother, and he's not going to tell me because then he's going to get suspicious. And two, the high priest, and he's not going to tell me. So she's like, well, they're going to ask questions. And then she thought about it. She's like, remember that creepy high priest who told me I was of the devil? He was banished. I wonder where he went. And she looks out in, into the um, drachma and she sees a little fire out there and she's like, I bet he's out there. I bet he escaped to there because they were going to put him to death because he was a Yatu. Um, let's go out to the city of the dead. And that's what they did. Yeah. And Azad, of course, demands that he goes with her because he can protect her from anything. Yeah. Even though she's the one that can kill anybody with one little touch. That was one of my big, um, like, diving into Wikipedia moments was, what is a drachma? Because they referenced it a few times. And it was all lowercase. I'm like, they're not explaining this. I got to go look it up. I was like... <laughs> Ooh, these things were huge. 
Like they were giant buildings that were outside the city and you would just put the dead there for the vultures. Yeah. And it doesn't have a ceiling. Yes. I like that. It's cool. Yeah. It doesn't have a ceiling and yet it still feels creepy. Mm-hmm. And they they said something about like even the air around dead people is unclean. Like they really put this emphasis on the dead are unclean. You can't leave the dead on the floor because then it would become unclean. So she does find the high priest there after all. And he definitely tells her everything that she wants to know. And what she finds out makes her so mad that he is her first victim. Well, also, dun, dun, dun. also he like smacks her in the face and starts trying to take her hostage. Oh, yeah. yeah. He to wasn't very her. nice. Yeah. yeah. But I was just really proud of her for taking her first life. Just taking your first kill. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that that had a big impact on her. She was like PTSDing hard after that. Yeah. She was like, I am a monster. Well, also <sighs> she was like, I, I was also, I did it not only out of protecting myself and Azad, but also I was curious on what would happen and how it would, how this all works and went down. And so I think she focused too much on that aspect of it instead of, for survival and protection and that was like why she like kind of spiraled into like i'm a monster yeah i think that was a it wasn't a completely unnatural reaction and like you said i think she focused way too much on that because had that had she been carrying a a club or a grenade or a magic (laughs) wand or some other way to take a life i think she would have been saying the same thing she's like well if i didn't really want to take a life why would i have been carrying this yeah, she re- she starts second guessing herself a lot, yeah. but I think the the one of the telling things is right after she kills him, like, you know, Azad was like, "All right, let's beat feet," and she was like, "No, we have to put his body in the right place," and she just was like, "We have to make sure that he's taken care of," and he's like, "Oh, okay, well, I'm just sack of potatoes." picks him up and puts him over onto one of the slabs, which is where the dead are supposed to go. So even in that, like. I just killed a person state. She was like, no, no, no. We got to do the right thing Yeah. by this. And so I think that that was a good telling of like that. She's not evil. Right. She's just traumatized at this point by a lot of things. I'm surprised that she's the only one that has this power because it gets revealed that the way that she got her power was through a Peric like giving a little vial of blood to the mom and she put the baby like a few drops in water and this like dipped her baby in the water and then now she has this like crazy curse Mm -hmm. um that's not a lot of uh sacrificing or anything involved that's not even really like a powerful like spell or anything so i'm really surprised that she's like the only one that yeah well i i have a feeling it's because of the um they don't hold back very often on humans. So if they captured a human baby, they would just be like, okay, well, let's just bathe them in a bit more of the blood and turn them into a full div. Mm. Because that's what they said the results of doing a lot of it would do, would be you just become full div. Oh, okay. So that's how the divs are made. Is Interesting. I I, missed that part. I think that's what she said. And she's like, for you, it's only a couple drops and that's what would happen. So you are part div. You are part demon. Um, oh yeah, so Shamar rolls up to the mom and tells the mom that she let one of his parrots go in that he had captured, and so he's going to take something from her, and it's revealed that it's her daughter because he wants to get married eventually, and so that's why she's like, I need to curse my daughter so he doesn't come and grab her and marry her. Yeah, he pre-ordered a bride. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the part where the mom is kind of confessing what she did, like cursing her own daughter to her daughter, she said, there were times I even envied your curse because I thought you would never know the fear that I knew when the Shamar found me in the forest. Um, but he didn't hurt her. or it, I mean, it, they didn't say that he had hurt her. He only said, I'm going to take your firstborn daughter. And marry her. Yeah. Yeah. But when he came to her, that would be terrifying. Mm -hmm. Because any person in power comes at you, you know that you fucked up, and then they have the power to 
kill you. And he's a full on demon too. So even though he didn't do anything to her in that moment, him coming up would put so much like you would just be the embodiment of fear for a Mm -hmm. second. And so she was thinking if I gave my daughter the curse of if you touch me, you'll die. She wouldn't, her daughter wouldn't have that same fear because if, if this demon guy came up to her, she, could she knows him. that if he touches yeah. her, he dies. So and she wouldn't have that fear that her yeah. mom had. And then Azad was so touchy feely with her, I think, like to kind of prove, like, mm. like I can, because he says it in the book, I can touch you. And she's like oblivious to it because she's like, oh, no, no one can. But I think that kind of goes on to another level. It's like, well, I don't think he was. I think he, well, because of the story of the book, he did kind of aid her in taking out the curse or taking the curse off of her. But I think he would have still grabbed her even when she wasn't cursed because he he shows up and she's still cursed and he's still like touching her and stuff. So he doesn't no, show but- he doesn't show fear, but he never touches her. Yeah, he, he doesn't her- touch her body. Yeah, yeah. only her hair. And well, he- like he has his armor under shoulder, like his, his her skin. He does touch her body. But, like, not her skin. Yeah. But I think he's, like, power move kind of thing. Like, so I touch you. So, after they go and talk to the high priest that she kills, they find out from him that the magic feather is in this fire, so that they go there. The fire protection. Right. And so, what she has to do, she finds out from the demon, is take that feather and prick herself with it, and that will take away her curse. But, Azad never does anything make never makes any kind of approaches other than like his little flirtiness Mm -hmm. until she takes the curse away so i think that the curse was working oh okay i didn't catch on to it until it happened and of course in hindsight exactly like one what you were saying where like he was like i'm glad that you killed him good job proud of you (laughs) but like it didn't really like connect with me that he was kind of guiding that whole path for her Mm. until all of a sudden now that she has no powers he reveals himself to be this demigod the first kiss too yeah Yeah. oh yeah on top of all that now now that we're discussing it and in hindsight what of it's almost like he's tempting her with these like little like physical touches that he's like putting her armor it's almost like you know wouldn't this be so great if you weren't cursed i think about if you weren't cursed like we could actually touch so to not have like to have people be so scared of her and then he's it's almost like he's leading leading her on with the like physical proximity there's just being closer and like the so promise of more yeah and of yeah. course it's like if i could get rid of this curse that i didn't put on myself and yeah it's like he he definitely knows what he's doing to me it had real even the apple vibes where literally he's a serpent he he um, so Azad is actually the Shamar that we were talking about that the mom was so afraid of. So he turns into Shamar, who also has this serpentine form. With bat wings. With bat wings. And so this whole time, he's just been whispering in her ear, like, oh, eat the apple, eat the apple, eat the apple. It's not an apple. It's get the feather. But, and then she does, and she's cast out of her safety net. And I just thought that was a really interesting Mm -hmm. analog. I thought about something like when I was reading that part, right when she was about to pull the feather and I was like, I thought back to something early on in the book where she said she always, as a child, rapidly paid attention to her mom's story. And she was always told the same story, the story of this girl who frees a woman and then a big, Div comes down and curses her and you know it, it's basically her story of of this but slightly changed right mm. um and she always was hoping for a different ending that there would be a different ending you know she's cursed the little girl's cursed and then she can't touch anybody and she always because it's her story she was always hoping that it would end differently if the mom had told it a story slightly different do you think this would have happened like, I think that if she, if the mom had paid attention just enough and altered the story over time just enough that the mom was doing it to, to protect the child and eventually give the whole truth, mm. right? Um, if you were to do that over time, and then I think that the 
you could easily reveal the truth to the kid. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Especially with and the if, use of a story. Yeah, instead of uh, making it seem like she was cursed, like, hey, you're, one day this is going to be your power, and this is what will, you know, this this will bring us salvation instead of, oh, poor you, you were cursed. Right, but even even you could bring it to the point where the mother then, like, she could incorporate that whole, like, you know, the Shamar cursed her her firstborn daughter right mm-hmm. right but not in that way but he was going to kill her and so she did the protection to protect her from this shamar that would have altered the story just enough to be like oh my mom like the person did this to protect me yeah, yeah. she right? made a sacrifice on instead my behalf. of being like a rebel rebellion yeah. it's like oh no my mom actually loves me because at, at that point when she takes the feather she's just like i just want to be selfish for once i want to do this for me and I have a feeling that if the story was slightly altered, it oh, might yeah. not have gotten to that point. Yeah, and then know. she's the like, mom's not even surprised though. She's like, "Yeah, I probably should have told you." Yeah, the that mom definitely um, agrees with you, Chris, because she kind of even says, "Like, I told it this way when you were little because I didn't want to scare you because you were a baby." And then as time went on, she just never changed her story, and she wished that she had. Uh, The mom definitely goes into like this monologue kind of talking about how she can see ways that it would have made a better story that wouldn't have ended up with the demons taking over the city. So she does acknowledge that. Yeah, you just got to tell people the truth sometimes. It might (laughs) suck, but fess up. It would be hard to know as a parent. I'm not a parent, so I can't say for sure, but I, I assume that it would be hard to know when the right time to do that would be because I can see not wanting to tell an infant a story about how oh the king wants to take you as their wife and also he's a demon like i don't know what age that becomes appropriate to say i would have been like eh, six or seven then you start teaching them hand-to-hand combat but give them full gloves and everything <laughs> be like if someone tries to come up and marry you here's how you whap a doodle them Real quick. Someone tries to come to, up and marry you, you out of out take, of a dark alley. Take take off your gloves first, <laughs> and then you and then you'll be able to kill them like a viper. Yeah. And then you can be an assassin, like you were talking about earlier, yeah. Juan. So we have a self fulfilling prophecy of the curse written down. Okay, so the self fulfilling prophecy was around that the mom was told by the by the demon, "I'm going to marry your daughter," and so she immediately went and got her kid cursed, so that way she would like. Be unmarriable. Be unmarriable. However, did she not realize she's in the city that's protected by the fire that keeps the demons out? All she has to do is tell her kid, don't leave the city walls. A demon's going to marry you. Do you really want to marry a demon? Some people might say yes. They like the tentacles, but <laughs> oh but probably not her. 16 years old is exactly the time when you think that you want to marry a demon. <laughs> I mean... That's true. <laughs> I, I, I mean, yeah. I what? mean, this is a young adult book, and mm-hmm. it has an audience. <laughs> I mean, that she, entire audience she is got rooting kind for of, that bad guy right she now. She got yeah. kind of frisky with Moth Lady. It's a sexy snake. Yeah, yeah, she did. Yeah, yeah. So she, so I think it was just a self fulfilling prophecy. It was one of those that I tell you this random thing. It's not a curse. Like it didn't even say he used any magic powers to do this. He was just like, I'm gonna do this thing, and she's just like. Nope, I'm going to use demon magic to stop you. And it's like, wait a second. If you would have just not done that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, he may have forgotten about it. Who? I mean, he's a demon. He's got stuff to do. He's not going to be like, oh, yeah, I he's forgot a- I was going to marry that one chick. But, but I met <laughs> other... No, I did. Yeah, he's not only a demon. He was the original, like, baddie. Not the yeah. destroyer, but he was, like, the original guy who was like, I'm the king and I'm all good, except I'm going to start killing people and sacrificing two a day. And then... He's like the original Div, like the the big yeah. guy. Like, why would he want to even have one wife that's not even born yet, and it would be human? Like, you'd think that like, he could just choose anybody. Like, well, he, why this one? Why he not wasn't ready to the Because right it's there. punishment yeah. for that girl releasing his wares. He, there's plenty of parrots out there. He could capture another one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he yeah. But I her. think that he took yeah. it as a, no, if you cross me once and I don't, give you Mm. repercussions for it then you'll think it's okay to do it again which is not stupid because the mom never did it again and she's also the queen yeah so to say to her becomes the queen right later on yeah but i think i yeah i don't know if she was the queen at that time she was like 12 okay 
She was really young when she did it. Gotcha. Okay. So maybe he maybe he knew that. Maybe he foresaw that she would be queen and he's like, and I will oh, marry, yeah. I will marry into your okay. family. Yeah. Oh yeah, maybe. Maybe yeah. he has like certain powers or something. Because yeah. the Peric knew her name. So I think yeah. either at the time she was a princess or something. So like Oh, was, maybe he knew yeah. too that she was like royalty and he's like already planning his like he maybe he, he could saw have that had he, spies that he was like okay now this person we need to get in the in the palace because she's yeah, gonna do some weird my, shit uh, well, that's my also, opportunity to re- regain my throne essentially yeah he could Par- have foreseen that parvina knew quite a bit about uh soraya's life mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. and so whether that's just intuition actually now that i think about it it would be funny if it was a demon spy network but she had like some intuition into her life so maybe well, she he, knew the owl lady. Okay. That cursed Soraya. Oh, uh, yeah. See, it is the Demon Spy Network. Yeah, Demon Spy is 101. Yeah. Like, let's set this up so that way a Demon King can be ruler. But they're against each other, right? Demon King is... So they say. Uh, yeah, the Demon King hunts them for sport. But mm-hmm. how much truth is there in that? So, yeah. What are your... Guys I think there is a lot of truth in that. So, the I think that the... Well, we said there were three different subcategories of yeah. divs. Yeah. Well, the Perics are definitely not in with the other two groups. They're definitely on the outside. Especially they can almost pass as human. I see the other ones being a little envious of that. Yeah. yeah. And so... Especially so, like Beak person. Yeah, or the Rhino guy. Yeah. Yeah. I just imagine... I, I'm now imagining... Because I'm just going through Disney movies at this point in my head. <laughs> so I just imagine Yzma's lair and like you've got... Um, like yeah. all, all the little potions that are turning people into like random, like you, you have a squid guy who's just like, oh. or octopus guy with like a lot of battle axes <laughs> or, you know, uh, what is it? Uh, Robin hood with the, all the like rhino people. And oh the, yeah. Uh, yeah. The guards. Yeah. So where we just left off this book. So the, the demon has taken on control. Uh, Soraya does not have any powers. Her brother has, basically forfeited the throne to the demon everybody is held hostage soraya is not held hostage she actually ran away she freed piranha <laughs> she was taking piranha through the, the little castle walls mm-hmm. and then she exited the castle walls and um shamar was like nope you're mine and piranha got away but she got whooped. and then the, then demon was like you know what you're, there's a safer place for you and flew away and that's where it ends oh yeah that's right yeah he did his little bat wing of like let's go bye bye and then she like decided to finally open her eyes look down realized she was very high up and passed out yeah that was a good spot to end yeah, yeah. perfect spot to yeah. end that was like the She's cliffhanger like, in the tv suspenseful. series mm-hmm. um what do you guys think what's happening next prediction prediction time, time. kelly you go first what do you think I think that she's going to escape and go and find all of the different parics, the ones that s- cursed her in the first place, and have them recurse her. But they're going to follow her and help her take the crown back. All right. So I think he's taking her to Mount Azure, A Z U R E, I think. Um, I think they mentioned that earlier. That's the place where all the, the divs are, right? Mm, so okay. he's taking her to Demon Castle 101. And then. She's going to be deposited there. There's going to be some issues with her being there. But um, Shamar is going to be called back to the castle because he wants to be in his castle, his actual castle. So he goes back to actual castle and leaves her in the, in the like, here divs don't kill her. She's going to team up with the Parrax and the Yatus. I think, she, think she's going to get on their side. And then um, there's going to be a big throwdown. I think brother and mother die. She becomes queen. Um, and I think at the very last minute, Big Bird is going to show up with his big feathers and be like, pew, big feathers from the creator. And just like shoot feathers everywhere. Pew, pew. Oh, feather the feather big powers uh, to everyone. Yeah, the, the protection bird. The mm-hmm. Simorg? The she, one that Shimorg. provided the fire of... Yeah, the one that gave the first feather? protection fire. Protection feather, yeah. Protection feather, and that they were burning for protection. I think that thing's going to show back up. There's, It's too much of a um, Chekhov's rifle to not have that show back up. Cool. One. My 
prediction was actually kind of along the lines of uh, yours, Kelly, where uh, I was thinking that, uh, especially since we know early on that these parics do not let a good deed go without returning the favor, that somehow she was going to find, she would either find her way out or they may come looking for her because they know what kind of predicament she's in. And we find out that, like, we understand a little bit more about, like, the politics that are going in, going on within the divs and how the Parix will, it's like the enemy of my enemy is my friend kind of a thing where they're like, well, it would be in our best interest to get rid of this guy. It would also be in your best interest to get rid of him. And they will team up and figure out how to get rid of him. Hmm. Let's see. What do I think that's going to happen? I do think that she teams up with the Parix. I think we're all on the same page on that one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, For the first time, we all agree on something. Yeah. Uh, I kind of want there to be a romance. Maybe not with the king, obviously. But... Ooh, with Moth Lady. <gasps> yeah, maybe. Yeah. I yeah. mean, they, they, were, they were getting close to that with the... Uh, the massage with the oil or whatever. The feather. The feather that oh, was the healing. Feather. The, there was, the feather was healing her wings. Yeah. She very, very gently... Healed all the wounds. And then started touching her skin mm-hmm. because she could finally touch skin. And she's just like She any teams skin. up with the Parix more than teams up with them. Huh. Yeah, I'm... She teams up thoroughly. <laughs> <laughs> I think the world... It's going to be like all like world altering though. Like Parix are not just going to be seen as demons anymore. Like she's going to like make it so that they can kind of reunite with the... Humans as like good good guys, and not be seen as so not outcasts anymore. Yeah, maybe that's what I think's gonna happen. Cool. And the bird Especially thing. After she welcomes one into her home. Yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah. So yeah, I think uh, yeah teams with the par- Parix. Um, I'm hoping for another romance that's actually not an evil guy, and uh, that the bird comes back. I don't really know about. The whole mother and brother situation, though. I can see them dying because it gives an opportunity for her to have to rule and be queen. I could see that. You know what is funny? At least if she's queen, she will never have to say heavy is the crown. (laughs) Because it's a big, glamorous crown and and it looks so, like, impressive and crazy and it's actually hung from a chain from the ceiling at exactly head height. So it looks like you're wearing it. I thought that was a very <laughs> bizarre detail. It's so oh, funky. She goes into such intense detail about it, too. I was like, I really want to see this in person. What does that look like from a commoner? <laughs> that was so silly. <laughs> I wonder if there's a little like... It's on a wh- crank, right? Must be. It must be on some kind of crank or like little adjusting thing, and the the priest is in the background, like lowered a little bit. You were sitting in it last like, night, oh, weren't no, you, he's tall Sam? Yeah. Yeah. Because like, what if what if someone else wanted to like pretend to be king, but it was like a little kid and just had snuck in there and was like sat down and like lowered the crank down. So the king comes in, and he's like, "Why is this at chest height?" This is where we're folding the page corner. Next time we'll finish up Girl Serpent Thorn and talk about what's next on our bookshelf. You can buddy read with us on Goodreads and Instagram at Dog Ear Discourse or view our reading schedule for the year on our website at dogeardiscourse.com. Thanks for joining.